Welcome to the branch and Merry Christmas. So glad y'all are here. If you're new with us, we'd love it if you guys would fill out a connect card. They're in the hallway over there. Uh, push some information down and we'll get you plugged in here at the branch. Uh, we only have a few announcements as we're headed into the new year, um, which is we just have a photo shoot kind of thing at the front if you guys want to take pictures. And then we do have uh, a service next Sunday. So if you're able to make it, we'd love to see you guys out here. Um, and would you guys prepare your hearts as we head into our Advent reading, led by Ben and Jamie. All right, today's reading is from 1 John. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can, he love, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Please bow your heads in prayer. This is a prayer that I wrote for us on love um, as we study this today um, for the last week of Advent. Uh, Lord, we thank you so much for this last week of Advent and that we can celebrate your love. You loved us so much that you sent your love, sent your son to be born and to live his life sharing your perfect love. There truly is no greater love than this. Help us to know your love in a great and mighty way so that we can share it with those around us. Help our church to be founded on it and to grow based on this love. Lord, please let the most visible part of our front porch to be your love. We praise you and thank you for these things. Amen. you go ahead and stand with us. Strong 
enough to lead us we're singing glory glory let there be peace let there be peace singing glory glory let there be peace let it start in me we're singing glory glory let there be peace let there be peace singing glory glory let there be peace let it start in me let there be peace let it start in me
poets and prophets, minstrels, musicians, artists, artisans of all kinds have tried their best to define what love is. Can it really be described completely? Scientists can do study after study to try to determine the logic behind it, to try to prove what it is, but can it really be proven? Is love just a feeling? Is it something that we can actually put hands on and and describe? If I were to ask you to give me a definition of what love is, what, what would you say? What would it be? We could go to music and come up with lots of songs that might give us a partial answer but can we adequately describe it in just a few words? My experience has taught me that sometimes the simplest answer is the best answer altogether, and so sometimes we have to go to some of the most juvenile of sources in order for us to get the best definition of something, and so I want us to look at one of those juvenile sources to go and find our definition of what love is. What happened to your kiss? I was wrong about him. It wasn't true love. But we ran all the way here. Please, Olaf, you can't stay here. You'll melt. I am not leaving here until we find some other act of true love to save you. Do you happen to have any ideas? I don't even know what love is. That's okay. I do. Love is putting someone else's needs before yours, like... You know, how Kristoff brought you back here to Hans and left you forever. Kristoff loves me? Wow, you really don't know anything about love, do you? Olaf, you're melting. Some people are worth melting for. Love is putting someone else's needs before your own. Mm. Some people are worth melting for, as Olaf says. In just two lines, Olaf gives us a pretty good definition of what love is. Love is selfless, and love is sacrificial. 2,000 years ago, we received the true definition of love and the greatest gift we could ever receive in the form of a tiny baby born to a virgin born in a stable he came and appeared not first to the elites of society but to those who had already been marginalized those who weren't very well welcomed into society he didn't start a publicity campaign to draw people to himself he kind of came in obscurity and even as he grew he didn't really attract people to himself. He more often got them angry with him to the point that at the end, uh, they not only wanted to kill him, but they succeeded in doing that. And yet his coming, his living, his dying, his rising again from the dead gave us the best definition of love that we could ever know. Selfless and sacrificial. On this Christmas Eve, on this fourth Sunday of Advent, We remind ourselves of that greatest love story ever told. God's love for his creation. And I love the way, again, going back to juvenile sources, I love the way that Sally Lloyd-Jones describes the Bible and the story of Jesus in her Jesus Storybook Bible. She says this, She said, the Bible is most of all a story. It's an adventure story about a young hero who comes from a far country to win back his lost treasure. It's a love story about a brave prince who leaves his palace, has thrown everything to rescue the one he loves. 
It's like the most wonderful of fairy tales that's come true in real life. And you see the best thing about this story is it's true. There are lots of stories in the Bible, but all the stories are telling one big story, the story of how God loves his children and comes to rescue us. It's the story of God and the story of God's love for us. The Bible even tells us that God is love. If we want the definition of love, we see it in who God is, but then he shows it to us by sending Jesus to us. The Gospel of John was written by one of Jesus' disciples, someone who followed him, walked with him. Jesus had 12 of those disciples, and out of those 12, there were three that were closest to him. And this John, who wrote this gospel, was one of those three. And funny, because throughout his gospel, he never refers to himself by name. He refers to himself as the one that Jesus loves. John understood what it meant to be loved by God. He defined himself as loved by God. And so it makes sense that a person who has defined themselves, who's found their identity in being loved by God, would have a lot to say to us about love. Around here at the branch, we will quote John 15, 5 often. That's where we get our name from. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And if we continue on in, in John chapter 15, just a few verses later, we can hear more about what John says. He says this, starting in verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. And Jesus understood what love was too because he was loved by the Father. And Jesus says, that the same love that the Father has shown to him is the love that he has for us. He tells us that we all are equally as loved. It doesn't matter what we've done. It doesn't matter where we've been. It doesn't matter how far we've strayed. God still loves us. God loves us because he created us in his image. Nothing else in all of creation was created in the image of God. And God loves us. Just if you hear nothing else, remember that. that. That God loves us and Jesus is proof of that. But God wants us to remain in him. And so he sent Jesus as a means for us to remain in his love. <clears throat> We're to walk alongside him. You know, when God first created Adam and Eve, there were moments when Adam and Eve and God would walk together. That was what God intended for us, was that we would have this intimate relationship with Him, that we would be together walking alongside Him. And then sin got in the way, and Jesus was God's answer, solution to the sin problem. He showed us through that solution, the very definition of love. But how do we remain in his love? Jesus tells us that's what we're to do. We remain in his love by obeying his commands. And then we might ask ourselves, well, what are his commands? What does he command us to do? And Jesus tells his disciples two things. He says, love each other as I have loved you. And greater love is no one than this, that a man lay down one's life for one's friend. Again, selfless and sacrificial. I've heard people say before that when Jesus was asked, how much do you love me? He stretched out his arms and he died for us. And it might be kind of a cheesy 
little uh, picture, but it's a true picture nonetheless. That Jesus showed us what it was to love by being sacrificial, by being selfless, by giving himself up for us. And the same John who wrote this gospel from which we read, and we also heard from a letter earlier that John had written to the early church. Later on in 1 John chapter 4, from which we had read earlier, he says this. This is what John writes. He says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You see, God showed love to us first, selflessly, sacrificially, by making the first step, by giving himself up for us. And Jesus says there's no greater love than laying down our lives for one's friend. And G- Jesus demonstrated this. He died not just for those who loved him, but for those who would love him as well. Paul gives us this picture in Romans chapter 5 when he says this in Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't somehow earn the love that God gives us. While we were still separate, while we were still far away, while there was still a sin problem for us, God made the first move towards us. And he said, this is love, that I have loved you first. Not because we're worthy of it, not because we've earned it, but because that's what love is. And the Father shows us that. You know, Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. God could have just thrown his hands up and said, you know what? Uh, I I messed up. I'm just going to walk away and cut my losses. But God didn't do that. He he said, I want to find a way. I want to make a way so that they can come back and have fellowship with me, have communion and community with me. God created a way to escape from the sin problem. But the problem is, some of us haven't realized that we need an escape plan. Some of us haven't realized that we need to find a way back to God. We're perfectly content being as we are. Last week we talked about joy. And in that, that God makes a way when there is no way. God makes the impossible possible. And as, as we come on this Christmas Eve, on the eve of celebrating the greatest gift that we could ever receive, we, we see that. That God made possible or made the impossible possible through the gift that he gave in Jesus Christ. That, that baby that was born to Joseph and Mary that night, he was the impossible coming through. He was the impossible uh, coming into uh, what we thought could never happen. He was the way where we thought there was no way. And it doesn't end there with us. We might say, oh, well, that's a great story It's a great love story to think about. Okay, well, God loved us enough that he he died for us. He gave himself up for us. Well, good, I'll receive that gift. But but what do we do with that gift beyond ourselves? What do we do with that once we accept it, receive it, understand it? We don't just keep it to ourselves. Jesus said, greater love is known than this to lay down his life for a friend. And he's talking to us as well. He's not just referring to himself. In fact, in Luke chapter 9, Jesus said this, whoever wants to be my my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. Selfless and sacrificial. That's what love is. That's what Jesus shows to us. And he calls us to show that same love to other people. He doesn't say, hey, I'm going to give you my selfless, sacrificial love and then just leave it there. But he's saying, I'm giving you this love so that you can pass it on to other people, so that you can give it away to other people. Again, the wisdom of Olaf is that he says love is putting others' needs in front of your own. And some people are worth melting for. I think Jesus would say everyone was worth dying for. 
Are we willing to make that same sacrifice? Are we willing to be that selfish with other people as well? When we look at other people, do we say, you're worth sacrificing for? Or do we walk away and say, ah, yeah, maybe not. I don't think so. Because Jesus doesn't look at any of us or anyone outside of this room, anyone in this world and say, well, you're not worth dying for. Jesus looked at us while we were still sinners and said, you're worth dying for. We've been talking over the course of these weeks of Advent about this idea of the front porch. You know, the front porch of our homes is the place where, where we meet people. And if we're not necessarily comfortable with them coming inside or they're not comfortable yet coming inside, then that's the place where we can meet them. But it gives us an opportunity to show ourselves to them and for them to see us. And then we all make decisions together whether or not we're going to go inside. The thing about the front porch is that when we go out on the front porch, we're exposed to the elements. It's not a a comfortable place all the time. We might have rockers out there and and nice places to sit. It might be have an overhang. But it's not the comfort and warmth and climate controlled of our homes, right? When we know what's inside, it's comfortable in there. It's safe in there. We're not exposed. We're not vulnerable inside. But once we step out on the front porch, we're seen. And we no longer have that safety, that protection, that that comfort of what's inside. And you know what? God doesn't call us to stay inside. God calls us to be out on our front porch and to say, hey, are we welcoming people? Are we displaying what we talk about during this Advent season, hope and love and peace and joy? Can people see that on our front porch? Is that what they see out there? You see, God calls us out of the comfortable places to be on the front porch with those that he loves and that we should love as well. Sometimes loving our neighbors means leaving what's keeping us inside. What keeps us there? What kind of excuses can we come up with? Is it the familiar? Is it the safe? Is it the comfortable? Are we afraid to step out into the elements a little bit? Are we willing to say like Olaf, loving someone is putting their needs in front of my own? How is it that a cartoon character can teach us this truth? The truth that he speaks is actually the truth that Jesus speaks. And Jesus not only spoke it, but he gave himself as that example, selfless and sacrificial. And the Apostle Paul, in writing to the early church, the Philippians, he said this in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8, and your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. In other words, he was willing to put the needs of others before his own. Rather, he made himself nothing. He was selfless. By taking the very nature of a servant, he was sacrificial, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. I hope that none of us have to give our physical lives over for that, but that doesn't mean that we don't have to give up something. Love is sacrificial. Love is selfless, and that's what God calls us to. Jesus gave us, Jesus gave us the definition of love by being selfless and sacrificial. You know, love is not what our culture tells us. If we were to go turn on the TV or look on the internet, go listen to things or read things, we would have a very, very different definition of what love is. You know, love is a feeling. Love is emotional. Love is something where chemistry needs to be there. Sometimes love exists whether we want it to or not. Love is transcendent. It rises above all else. It doesn't pursue selfish things. It pursues things for the sake of others. And we are called to display that love, that sacrificial, that selfless love on our front porch. Even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's costly, even when it means sacrificing for the sake of others. 
As we go out and open our front porch, how do we display this love on our front porch? How do we let others know that we've been changed because God pursued us before we were ever worthy of it? And we can't be worthy. Only through Him are we worthy. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How do we see others? And Jesus tells us that we should be willing to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. It's easy for us to lay down and be sacrificial for the people who give it back in return. But how easily do we do that for everyone? Some people aren't worth melting for in our, eye, in our eyes. Some people aren't easy to sacrifice for. But God doesn't say, okay, well, just do it for the easy ones. Just do it for the ones that give back to you in return. No, that's not what Jesus did, and he doesn't call us to do that either. He says we need to be willing to give it up. We need to be sacrificial and selfless for everyone because who is our brother, anyone, or brother or sister, who? Anyone who is made in the image of God is worth melting for, (laughs) is worth sacrificing for, is worth giving yourself up for. Jesus said, greater love is no one than this, that they lay down their life for a friend. And a friend is anyone who is loved by God. And that means all of us. May we display the love of Jesus on our front porch that others might see and know the true definition of love, that we have been touched by that definition, that we have been changed by Jesus, and that they can see that there's something different that there's a love that they find in Jesus that they will find nowhere else. Let me pray for us. Jesus, you gave your everything for us. You've shown us that love is sacrificial. Love is selfless. And yet, God, trying to live that out is hard. We can't do that on our own. We need you to do that. And so, Father, I pray that as we consider, not just at Advent, not just during Christmas time, but all year long, as we consider what it means to display love and hope and peace and joy on our front porch, I pray, God, that others would see that and would know that there is something different, that in you we find the true definition of love. And so, Father, May we display that for everyone around us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that we talk about here at the branch all the time is partnership. And that's what John 15, 5 says that we have to remain in Him. And so our first partnership is with God. Um, But we also know that we partner together in our community to, as it says in Jeremiah, Um, to seek the peace and prosperity of the place where God has planted us. And so um, we believe here at the branch that uh, we need to give back to God, uh, and not because, again, we earn anything, but out of gratitude for all that he's given to us. And on Christmas Eve, uh, we're taking up this special offering. Um, One of the partners in our community that we partner with is the Patrick Henry YMCA. And over the last couple years, our Christmas Eve offering has gone to to help uh, sponsor and give scholarships to kids in the community so that they can take part in the the summer camp program. And so um, things that we're collecting tonight are going to go towards that. And so um, we're going to pass a basket as we go and, and sing these last couple of songs. Um, there are other ways to give as well uh, if you're not prepared for that. So make sure that if you want to give specifically for Christmas Eve, uh, that you earmark that. And there are ways to do that um, in the different digital uh, platforms as well. Um, just make sure that it says Christmas Eve 2023.
the stars in the sky look down where you are. Little Lord Jesus, asleep on the hill. The cattle are lowing, the baby knows. Jesus, your God, he makes. I love you, Lord Jesus, look down from the sky. Say by my cradle. Till morning is night. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask you to say. I find her and love. I pray, bless all the dear children in thy tender care. Let us from heaven to live. The stars in the sky look down when the middle of Jesus was sleep on the hill. If you have your uh, candles, you can light them. You don't have to worry about lighting anyone else on fire either. So these are child-proof, teenage-proof, adult-proof.
Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. And we are called to be the light and to shine the light of the love of Jesus Christ into the places where we go. And so may we show that love, that selfless and sacrificial love, as we go off into our front porches and display hope and peace, and love, and joy. We don't do it in our own accord. We don't do it in our own strength. But he gives us what we need. And so may we go with the authority of God the Father. May we go with the power of God the Holy Spirit. May we go in the name of God the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.